May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with a great deal of energy. May our studies be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cover with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. So you had a question, yes? Yes, I, I did have a question. Um, it refers to uh, Chandra as an example. Uh, Ramakrishna's mom, uh, she had, uh, let's say, bad vision and she decided to remain silent because of what the neighbors could say of her while the husband was away. Um, and I've got a question, which is, is this the right way to proceed and remain silent, or should we just kind of break free? Is silence a protector of all the spheres, or is it a jail? Um, how much is the worth of the acceptance of loved ones or even presence in our lives if we cannot be or express ourselves when like-minded people could become family and family or neighbors or friends turn into strangers. Okay, so uh, as I understand your question, uh, it seems to me that your question is uh, the value of silence when we have certain spiritual experiences. Uh, should we remain silent about them? And if so, why? And uh, if there are people who are like-minded, who are on the spiritual path and in tune with, uh, with our own thoughts and uh, experiences, should we share with them? Would that be uh, basically your question? So kind of is, yeah, but it's more into should we remain silent just because of what others can think of us or, or should we just break free and be ourselves and say, this is me? Really, what's the price of remaining silent and not being yourself and feel around the strangers mm. when they really are supposed to be you know, closest people. So, so we always have to balance our reactions with an element of uh, stability, an element of um, uh, reasoned out behavior, uh, as opposed to impulsive spontaneity. And there's a difference between that and intuition, spiritual intuition. So spiritual intuition means that we're tuned in continuously to a cosmic mind. I have to explain that. Don't think that you have your own mind. There's only one mind, that's a cosmic mind. There's only one body, that's a universal body, according to the Vedanta philosophy. So in the cosmic mind, and the cosmic mind comes from a whole categorization of what this world is and what it contains. And it's accepted by every system originating from the Sankhya's. What we call cosmic mind is also called personal God. Uh, some cosmic being that has the capacity to know that is omnipresent, that is everywhere present, and that is omnipotent, that is extremely powerful, and that is... Uh, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. These are the three kinds of qualities of a personal God. 
Should a god have qualities? Yes. What we call Brahman, the variety of it called Saguna Brahman, has qualities. That's what it means. That is Brahman with qualities. So those people tuned in to that particular cosmic mind. Saguna Brahman is the whole thing. Body, mind, everything else on the cosmic level, including its cosmic parts. But the, the cosmic mind itself is the supreme intelligence. And if you're tuned into that, then this is a spiritual instinct. If you are behaving from that spiritual attunement, that will always be pure and truthful. That will always carry through, no doubt. But if you have just a sudden impulse, which is not well reasoned out, and is not really in tune with the cosmic mind, then obviously the impulsiveness has to be avoided. We can be impulsive out of enthusiasm. We had a certain experience, so we are tremendously enthusiastic about it. And because of that enthusiasm, we blurt it out to all and sundry. Not everybody will accept it. And if people don't accept it easily, it can create social difficulties for us. So in Chandra Devi's case, that was it. What will people say if I say all these things? And is there a necessity for me to say these things? And their judgment was, no, it's not necessary to do it. So there has to be a place of reasoning that is also in tune with the highest intelligence that we have, that is cosmic mind. And cosmic mind will give us, alone will give us the green light or the red light, will give us a direction. But it requires a surrendering attitude. It requires letting go of the egoistic position, because sharing it can be also out of pride. And an unusual experience, let me tell somebody, because then they might think that I'm in some way special. So that would be a wrong evaluation and that will not do us any good. And then silence itself has a great, great value. A part of the reasoning process is to see, well, what is the value of us sharing everything with everybody? If we know something of deep and significant value, then it is something that is also precious. And we have to be selective who we share this to, with. Swami Vivekananda, when he gave talks, when he was part of a lecture on a lecture tour, Sometimes he came across an audience and felt completely disgusted with them and decided to cancel the lecture, go out to the stage, see what's before you, and walk off again, much to the horror of the people who expensively organized it, advertised it, got people on, uh, interested in and attending it. And uh, so he had an attunement to this cosmic mind that said, these people are here more out of curiosity to see an oriental man with a turban, a man that has such a great reputation in America that was the star of the parliament of religions. So we have to be selective. Now Jesus puts it in a very crude way. You don't cast pearls before the swine. That was his phrase. Of course, in the Jewish tradition, the swine or the pig is the most reviled of all the animals and was eaten by the Gentiles from the Jewish point of view, not by the select chosen people. And so the real treasures, the real important things you don't cast before everybody. So what you do in spiritual life, you react to people as is necessary. And when you are surrounded by many, many people, that have many, many different uh, histories, psychological histories, emotional histories, then uh, somehow one can feel extremely uncomfortable. So there are a few times where I have been in maybe cities or public places, and there I would feel extremely uncomfortable because 
the whole thinking, the whole psychological approaches and the, uh, the lifestyles, the habitual behaviors, the entrenched positions of those around may not be very comfortable. Do you now stand on the soapbox and tell them all about spirituality? No, it's not suitable. You give people what they require. And if you are forced to live in company that is uh, not conducive to your own spiritual life, then it's best to avoid them. But those, what about those who you feel are on the same spiritual path? Well, maybe I should say, maybe I should ask, who are you to say who's on the spiritual path or not? But supposing you're part of a society such as Ayurveda society or some other Vedanta society or uh, people, you know, the other week I was there with the Quakers, like-minded people, people interested in spirituality whose whole practice is silence, actually. And in the silence, something gets revealed. The silence is an opportunity for us to proverbial count to 10. And while we're counting to 10, all the emotions are steadied and we can then be in a decisive mode to see what should we express. And if there's no need to express anything, why express it? It's not necessary. People often ask about our own spiritual life or about our own spiritual practice or spiritual experiences. Have you ever had Samadhi? Very common question by those indelicate people, indelicate enough to answer this question, ask this question. And now you can decide again how to put it. You can simply frankly say, well, honestly, it's none of your business. That might be offensive. Or you yourself can respond by keeping quiet. Or you can simply say that's an inappropriate question or whatever it is. But we never discuss our own spiritual experiences. Why would we not do that? Would it not benefit somebody? There's no need for speech. And Swami Vivekananda again puts it like this. The radio waves can travel along a wire, but we don't actually need the wire. And there's a small editorial comment in Raj Yoga, which says, uh, this was before the implementation or discovery of wireless communication. He preempted it, he predicted it. If the radio waves are everywhere present and we have to catch it and channel it along a wire, well, if they're always present, then we can catch it anywhere. Same thing with thought. We can catch it anywhere. If we understand there's only one cosmic mind, then the broadcasting station is cosmic mind. And our reception area will be just the transmitter, that the transistor aspect of it, transmitter aspect of it, transistor aspect of it, and the broadcast in the same uh, in the same two points is exactly the same. Simultaneously, it is there. Nothing seems to travel because the broadcast waves are exactly in the environment, in the electromagnetic field, they are there. All we have to do is tune into it. Make sure that we tune well then. And as soon as we no longer tune into it, then our life gets disrupted. And this disrupted noise is equivalent to when our radio tuning goes off and we hear howling noises. And that's the signal for us to retune back to cosmic mind and stabilize ourselves more. So I don't think we should share everything with everybody. We should be discriminatory in terms of how we, how we share, who we share with. Should we be dictated by what other people think? only if it's going to affect our social environment unnecessarily. Uh, if that disruption is there unnecessarily, it's best to avoid it. Should we only respond because of evaluation, what will people think of us? The answer to that is no, because that's an egoistic position. 
when, I, when we question what will people think of us, how will people regard us, then you see that's more of an egoistic position. And the freedom should be, I don't care what people think of us. I don't people care what people think of me. Because as soon as I do that, I'm caught in a trap of egoism. What is egoism? An identification with a body-mind complex, an instrumentation. But we don't make the mistake with any other instrumentation. We don't say, I'm hearing, I'm listening to the radio, and the radio is my own voice, and I'm the radio. An instrumentation is clearly put into the category of object. And we, the listener, clearly put in the category of subject. Subject and object, when they get confused, is called egoism. So we should not be concerned with other people's reactions and modify our behavior in terms of what do other people think of us. Because that would be a, a, a kind of cowardice. A strong position would be, I am quite certain of my own inner conviction. I'm quite certain of my own inner truth. And that should be enough. And if other people don't like it or don't understand it, so be it. There's a great story of Bharat, who after a number of incarnations, his final incarnation, he decided, I won't cause any trouble. I'll keep completely silent. In all things, I'll complete, uh, be completely silent. And because of his silence, and because of his memory of previous births, all his family thought he was uh, slow, that he was a dull-witted person, that he was just unusually uh, stupid. Well, of course, inwardly, he was wiser than anybody. Then ultimately, because of his silence, a royal party passed. And uh, they see, saw that they needed another party to carry the royal person, personage there. And they called him, hey, hey, fellow, come on. And Bharat was so absorbed in his meditation practice and his attunement to the divine that he felt a sensitivity as he carried and uh, played his part in the palanquin. He was careful to walk and avoid all the insects. And so the whole thing went like this, you know, was disturbed and uneven. And then ultimately they said, they, hey, you know, obviously you're a fool. You can't carry this well. Then he, for the first time, spoke and said and described the sensitivity. No, it's not that I'm useless at carrying. It's not that I'm stupid. But can you see all these beings underfoot that I'm avoiding? Because the divine is fully, as much fully in them, though not fully expressed, as in you. And then it was realized, oh, what a complete, beautiful sage this is. And he was honored from there on. We can only really listen to the voice of the divine in silence. We have the saying in English, isn't it? Empty vessels make the most noise. So we have to be careful about noise around us and about the inner noise in our own minds as well and find some settlement there. And then from that base, a blissful base, we can radiate in a wise way and discern what to say and what not to say and to whom to say it and who not to say it. And those people who don't understand what you're speaking about, it would be like Ramakrishna's example of somebody with a precious jewel wanting to sell it, and he comes across a brindle seller. How much is this worth? But the man is thinking in brindles. This is probably three brindles. But only when he takes it to a jeweler that the jeweler says, ah, it's worth and he gives the exact worth. So we don't cast the pearl before the swine. And Jesus is really a crude kind of expression. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Swamiji. It's just sometimes um, 
I do understand the point coming from number four and 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 the, and the pride and, and you know and saying things to people who can actually, you know, uh, but sometimes it's just a feeling of what am I doing in here because it's like they say, for example, it's like if you're sitting in a place, like say you're with you know friends from I don't know childhood, just to put an example and. They say, oh, he just likes orange and he likes to wear orange. So, and then you're just sitting there, you're just looking silent and then you're just thinking, but I, I, I'm a Swami, that's, that's what I do. Um, but it's just like listening to, <laughs> to something, you know, it just... It just and you know, and you know, it's just it's it's very it's very difficult. It creates a lot of it's like you can't engage with people. You you suddenly lose that link. It's like you can see them, you can see their soul that doesn't change. But, yes, yes, I mean you you will find that as you grow spiritually, that there'll be a natural selection process and old friends will have to fall by the wayside. You know, and you'll get and you'll have new associations or no associations whatsoever. You know. Yeah. So because I've seen I've seen that many times, and it's just like does this need to then happen with family as well? I mean Yes, yes, regrettably it can happen with family also. Because it, you know, sometimes I, I do get this feeling of this you know it just it, it just doesn't make sense to me and sometimes it gets to a point where it affects you because of their behavior so it's 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 not in a point of me silence it's actually like this behavior no it's, actually... it, no, it's also your behavior so i know a devotee and they'll know who they are so i won't I obviously won't mention any names and when they visit home the family custom will be to engage in uh, alcoholic parties and this person's life has changed they no longer find any enjoyment in that and so they they they're there because it's family and what they do is they have a non-alcoholic drink and that is being made fun of because of the culture around them and because of the family culture also so what do you do? You can't engage with them. You can't come down to their level, surely. You have to remain above. And so, yes, regrettably, sometimes even family, you may have to avoid. But you see, you have to evaluate, is it worth it on the spiritual life, in spiritual life, on the spiritual path? What are you prepared to sacrifice? And if you're keen to go on this path, and if you're keen uh, to uh, progressively intensify your spiritual life from day to day. And that is what growth is all about. Growth is about change. It's not about remaining static. Some devotee that hasn't contacted me for a while, and how is you? Yes, I'm, I'm good doing my spiritual practice. But quite clearly, they're not doing anything more. They're not in this, this remaining static. In other words, it's hollow. It has no real meaning or feeling within it. And so you have to intensify the spiritual practice as much as you possibly can. Now, that's part of growth because growth inevitably is change. And change is not just change, but growth is positive change. It's not regressive change, it's progressive change. And if you want to do that, then you have to be selective about the company you keep. And that is why Ram Krishna gives these four directives, one of which is keep holy company. It's like if you are an alcoholic, would it be good to go and say, let me visit my friends in the, in the pub? It's not going to work because you'll be tempted to drink. So that's the difficulty. So a sensible person will say, let me be extremely careful initially because in spiritual life, the first thing will be protective, like a small plant. Small plant, you put a fence around it, 
you want to make sure there are, there's water. You won't rely on the weather necessarily. You may give it some nutrients, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. That's uh, quite natural to do that. But when it's fully grown, you don't need to bother about all those things. Nature itself will take over. Nature itself is growing from within. Within you, within me, within everyone, there's a natural divine that wants to grow and express. And as it's growing and expressing, it also will draw in all the components necessary for growth. We don't have to worry too much about that, but the effort has to be on our part. Now, once all that is done, we are confident enough to go anywhere. We can no longer, we don't no longer have to be so selective. And we can now freely engage with everybody because our position, our way of thinking has shifted. We're now seeing the divine in everything and in everyone. And because of that, our response will be different. We can then engage in all kinds of things that formerly might have been taboo in our early spiritual life and still remain stable, still remain uh, closely connected and tuned to the divine. We can be walking down the busiest street and remain in t attuned or in a forest or a mountain scene and still be attuned. But somebody who is not mature and seasoned will be in a mountain scenery and be disturbed. Somebody who is walking down uh, a street, a busy street in a city may well be calm. So it depends on your inner spiritual strength and your inner spiritual maturity. And it takes some time to get to that maturity. There's no doubt. And, and uh, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Go on. Okay. Um, I had a question, Swamiji. I had two questions. One is regarding the spiritual maturity and the growth you were speaking about. So in the early spiritual life, uh, or yeah, throughout the spiritual life, there are also setbacks. Sometimes uh, it's uh, difficult to be very disciplined and uh, not heed to, you know, the uh, chitta or vrittis, it comes. So what should we do during those times to come back um, and move to go in the correct paths to keep going on and not be demotivated? But the, the difficulty is that motivation in the first place. We have to keep motivated. How do we keep motivated? Not how do we keep the practice up. The practice will be as a result of motivation. So we have to persuade ourselves of the truth. And uh, yeah, so we have to keep ourselves motiv motivated. How do we do that? It's not in the practice uh, in, that we think it is. It's in seeing God in everything in our daily life. Seeing God in everything and everywhere as we walk, as we work, as we do all the activities. Because if you th think that spiritual life is only at uh, six o'clock in the morning or something like that, six o'clock to seven o'clock, whatever it is, then proportionately, that's a very tiny proportion of your day. Hardly 1% of your day is like that. So it is the rest of the day that we have to take care of. We have to cultivate the art of seeing that divine in everything and everyone. Learn to do that. And that's where your motivation comes from. But then the principles have to be established. And that is based in scripture, scripture and teacher. It talks like this where repeatedly we're saying that there's only one being. There's only one being and the practice is seeing the self in all beings and all beings in the self. So what does practice constitute of? Constitute of? Two things, discernment, what is called viveka and vairagya, that is detachment. What does detachment mean? It doesn't mean being like a stone block with no feeling, no. It means that we are putting things in the correct perspective. And in a way, vairagya is the effect of viveka. Viveka means constantly seeing the divine in everyone. 
the jnani yogi as well they do an elimination process we're looking for the reality they'll screen out the things which are impermanent but that doesn't mean to say that the permanent is not seen it's not all negation it's a contrast when you negate something you see ah there's something positive there what is a kind of flowing thing that we call life and that gives an operational uh, movement to every limb to every hand every head every heart every uh, every movement is because of some divine flow which is constant because the source of it is constant it's present everywhere I mentioned you see cosmic mind we don't require a separate uh, a, a separate delivery from a cosmic broadcasting station because it is here it is wherever we are it's there so that's the constancy in an impermanent environment so discernment is necessary this is the way that the jnanis do it how is the how is the bhaktas what do they do they feel a thrill because they see my beloved is there in every single person and every face i see it's there how do we do this discernment if we're a karma yogi well we become discerning because we are tuned into a certain steady presence here and now in this moment and we don't have any regard for uh, the effects of any of our actions at all we're not interested in the results because that gives us disturbance karmaniye va tikarasji ma palesho kodachana see we only have one right we were discussing with somebody earlier the right to work that's all we don't have the right to anything else we don't have the right to assert the human dignity we don't have the right to assert our uh, our social status we don't have a, a right to uh, insist on uh, gender equalities none of this because none of this belongs to us and in terms of the south the atman there's no gender whatsoever so we only have the word the right to work this is krishna's language in the chapter 2 is the 47th stanza when the people emphasize rights human rights and so on and so forth then i tended to to point out this particular useful stanza to work alone you have the right never to the fruits of your work or any actions this is the karma yogi's discernment and immediately there becomes a detachment detachment because these fruits or these effects are don't do not belong to me let not your motive be the fruits of your action now as soon as you replace that you now have a motive in spiritual life the positive side of it now takes its place then you can easily sit down for meditation that doesn't mean to say that until you get that you should not meditate formally no you should do that as well but think about it now particularly at the end of the day when you sit down what will come into your mind unless you handle things in situ during the day it will be all the disturbance and difficulties of the whole day it all crowd in and demand its attention but if everything is stable during the day if you do all actions for the divine if your whole spiritual life is in your work and your interaction with colleagues and so on and so forth then when you sit for meditation it's a deepening of this feeling that you had in the other parts of the day in the majority of your day in the 90 percent of your day it's all there if you have peace of mind there you have peace of mind in your meditation and that is why the prerequisite for meditation is to control so self-control has to be there controlling the senses controlling the mind then meditation becomes easy so this motive has to be there but it has to be backed up supported by a conviction that is contained in scripture that actually indwelling 
everybody, every being is that divine self. It sits there in the center of your being. So that when you walk, you learn to practice that. You look around here and there, and you see the beauty, the blissful base, the divinity and everything. And you'll notice also the corresponding inward movement that uh, is there as a result of that. An inner kind of feeling of internal joy, not apprehension, not worry, not fear, not doubt, but an internal joy. If you try to sustain that, will that not become motivating? If we are faced with two things, the secular joys that are presented to us and the spiritual joy where we see the extra dimension in it, then uh, would you not automatically be motivated to go for the most joyful thing, the most blissful scenario, the most blissful way of behaving and the most blissful way of responding to things? You'll do it. So yes, in the beginning, you said in the beginning, I understand that, but every second is the beginning. We start now. Yes, so much. And, the, and, then the, and then that becomes practice. There's a reason why they call it practice. <laughs> <laughs> you see, practice means to constantly do it, constantly, constantly, constantly do it, repeatedly do it. That's why, that's practice. Don't ask me when it will happen. The more you practice, the quicker it happens. And so that is why in the, I often quote it in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, it says, success is speedy in this effort of yoga. Success is speedy for the highly energetic. And the results depend on whether it is uh, mild or medium. Uh, so, okay, that's in terms of spiritual practice then. Uh, spiritual practice, practice itself means repetition of a given formula. So continue, con continuously uh, repeating the thing that we know, know works. How do we know if something works? Because a teacher gives you reassurance about it and teachings give you reassurance about it. And this is the value of scripture. Every procedure has to be scripturally based. You can't avoid it. What kind of scripture? Well, we use the Upanishads, basically. Why should we use that and not other any other scripture? Is because the Upanishads contain pure practical philosophy without any theology, without any doctrine, without any dogma, and corresponds, therefore, to Swami Vivekananda's beautiful summary about it, that there is a goal. What is that goal? That goal, each soul is potentially divine. It starts off with that statement. Each soul is potentially divine. We have to know it. That's a difficult part. But we start off with understanding my soul is divine. Then we go on. If my soul is divine, every soul is divine. Is there a danger of ego someday? Yes. Because if we, are so, if we say I and the body are one, then there's a danger in that, of course. So each soul is potentially divine. Why do we say potentially? Why don't we say divine? Because we don't know. We have to unfold, manifest this potential. So each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to do what? To manifest this from within. And what will be the result of it? We will then control the whole of nature, internal and external. That is our very thought movement would be powerful enough to change any condition anywhere if we have the will to do it. Somebody is sitting, meditating in a cave and repeating a thought with every faith and confidence, without contradicting it, without doubting it. It acts in a straight line and mobilizes all the divine forces of the universe and arranges that in such a way, according to the will of the cosmic mind, that we conventionally call God, and arranges, arranges all the condensed factors that we ourselves put in, 
in the thought. A wonderful arrangement, something similar to the drama where the sun's heat evaporates all the water, leaving the salt behind in the oceans, and then collects as clouds and builds up and builds up. You know, if you watch a cloud, you see how beautiful it is. You see a face in it, and then the, the wind moves it on, and the configuration changes, and then you'll see another thing. And then when you see it's dark, you can pretty much say, oh, it looks like rain. And sure enough, when the pressure builds up, see the drama unfolds and the rain goes, falls down on the earth and nourishes the thirsty earth and the, the earth drinks it nicely. And this is what we call life essentially. You can't live without the water. Thought is, plays exactly the same drama. You think something, you assert it without any contradiction. You put your resolve, your intention in and see what happens. It will unfold in the way that you have directed it, provided it is in tune with the cosmic will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, in this place here, in my immediate environment, as it is in the whole cosmos, as it is divinely intended to be. So controlling nature, internal and external, even external, we can control it. Very powerful thing. The most powerful resource we have is thought. And he's mentioning this, Swami Vivekananda, in the context of Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga, that is the yoga of concentration. Then, how do we do it? Well, we know these four methods are there, these four various yogas, one or more, or all of these, and be free. And then to mention all the subsidiary things, rituals and temples and so on and so forth. This really constitutes the spirituality, is this each soul is potentially divine. That we have to rehearse time and time again. We have to repeat it, repeat it. Because from childhood, we've been repeating something different. My name is so-and-so, my name is so-and-so, my mother is this, my father is that. Constantly we're repeating it. And as long as we're repeating that, we're entrenching our individualistic position more and more. When we get out of that and assert, oh, my nature is divine. What is the turning point in spiritual life? Turning point for me in spiritual life, in my teens, was I was taught, I'm a body with a soul. And then I came across a teaching from Raja Yoga itself. No, you are a spirit, you are a soul with a body. It's the other way around, didn't you know it? So this is, our, this is the conviction we have to have. And the, most of us will be bhakti yogis. And for that reason, we have to get our motive from the sweetness of our experience, the love. And we start off with human love and we see how the sweetness is there and we can apply that to divine love because that is ever constant and ever flowing human love is unreliable but divine love that's different that's where your motivation comes from so that if you are a person who lives in the head please get out of it and live in the heart instead <laughs> Swamiji, another uh, question. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, God created Prakriti and like the nature and everything and human as well. And we are in each birth reincarnated to realize the ultimate divine uh, within ourselves to not have the life. What, what is the a real purpose for God to create humans and the universe. Yes, so that's that's one way of looking at it, that God is the creator, creating the universe. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one perspective, which is very narrow, narrow and very limited and has to be exchanged. It will be exchanged naturally for a more mature position. It's not that God created Prakriti but God manifested Prakriti himself or itself from itself by itself and nothing else is there except itself. 
then ask this question again, what is the purpose of it? Do you think there's a purpose necessary? So in that way, there's a purposeless universe. Do we have any examples of that? Yes, a play. And that is why we have the concept of the change. This is an interchangeable term. Prakriti and Maya is there. These are two interchangeable terms. Prakriti says the thing that is rough and ruffled, the experience of the universe, which is uneven, which has ups and downs and pluses and minuses, that is made from three constituent components, ingredients, all playing with each other. This is called Prakriti. All right. What is the Maya then? Well, Maya says that this play, this interchange, is actually an appearance and disappearance. When one thing comes on, the other thing goes away, and so it's in a constant milieu, if you will, a constant state of change. And if you were in a room and an elephant suddenly appears, you'd rub your eyes and come to a conclusion. Oh, this is not real. If the elephant changes into a mouse all of a sudden, you'd rub your eyes and say, this is a trick, an illusion of some kind. So this is called Maya, which is just a statement of a fact. What is the fact? The fact is that things are not permanent, things change. And what we see as a reality is only a relative reality. If you take the relative part away, it no longer exists. In other words, a table exists because my eye is there to register it. My hands are there to register its dimensions and its touch and its texture. And my logic says it won't be supported unless it has four legs. A three-legged table is a little uncertain, a little wobbly. You know, in the old days, when I say old days, 1950s, 1960s, they had these cars with only three wheels. And you could see parking it would lean to one side and obviously not very stable. I don't know why they invented such a thing. I think it was an adaptation from a, from a Vespa scooter or something. But it's much more solid. You'd feel much more secure if your car has four wheels. So this is in relation to the senses that pick it up. And the mind is just ready to interpret what the senses present. It can't interpret something it has no previous experience of. If you say unicorns don't exist, well, there's a bit of a fallacy because a unicorn is something like a horse, let's say a white horse or a pink horse with a horn on it. Well, we've seen horns and we've seen horses and we've combined the two. We can never imagine anything we haven't previously experienced. So it's a relative world that we call Maya. Now we add another term, Lila Maya. If you ask what is the purpose of this appearance and disappearance, you have to come to this conclusion. It is the divine game that is taking place. It is a play. It is a play of divine waves intermingling amongst each other dancing with each other and we have to have a sense of humor about it therefore it is god's game that's the only way we can view it actually in a sensible way so we can't understand we can't say why did god create a useless world and a, a universe in turmoil and stupid people that wage war with each other well that's something like a childish way of viewing it and we don't have that view at all in Vedanta doesn't have this view. Hinduism doesn't have this view. For convenience term, sake, we say that there's a creator and creation. It's only convenience. But there's no Sanskrit term like that. It is projection. Shristi, projection. That's the term. Some, something projected from itself. This is probably a uniqueness in the theological approach within Hinduism, adopted with in many, many philosophies, Eastern and Western. Spinoza, for example, was a great Spanish uh, philosopher, mystic. Even the scientifically minded Einstein was a great admirer of Spinoza. So when Einstein says, God does not play God dice with the universe, 
he doesn't mean an extra cosmic creator God. He means Spinoza's God, which is something like panentheism, that is nature itself is God, and there's more, the transcendent aspect, exactly what we have and what we've described. And I began by saying, you see, one mind is there, one body is there. We call this body overall Purusha, cosmic person. And we call this cosmic mind. We can call it in, if we want to use the term creator, we say Brahma. But Brahma does not literally mean creator. Brahma is from the same root as Bra Brahman, that is Bra, the thing that gets projected infinitely. Something is projected infinitely. And modern cosmology has the concept. Whether it's accurate or not, we can debate that differently. But starting off from a single point, some singularity, and then a burst, and going on infinitely. And so modern cosmology says this is an infinite expansion going on. Uh, of course, it doesn't really make too much sense. It makes good mathematical sense, but not normal common sense, because we can only see as far as a border, and the border is governed by the speed of light, and therefore it's finite, whichever way you look at it. So this whole thing comes from one, one single entity. It is not a potter manufacturing a pot of clay, and we call it the world, and we don't like it, not at all. We have to shift our thinking. Thank you, Swamiji. Mm. Swamiji, what are the paths that we can follow? Saying if we leave it deep. So the the paths are the yogas, and there are four of them. And they are commensurate with the various faculties of the mind because we have a thinking faculty, we have a feeling faculty, and we have a willing and doing faculty. And there's a yoga to seat each one. So we have to employ by employing the faculty of the heart. This is called bhakti yoga and has a number of different modes. Bhavas, we call them, the sweetest and most difficult probably would be the aspect of lover and beloved, this relationship. This is a part of bhakti yoga. Or there is a sense of amorphous, secure presence. Or there is a, the, atmosphere, the attitude that God is my father or my mother or my parent or my master or my friend, my companion. And many of these could be blended together, of course. This is the path of bhakti. And why is it most suitable? Well, if you ask any person, do you ever get angry? And they say, yes. They say, please take this emotion and steer it toward a love of God. And then a karma yoga, of course, will be your normal working, waking life. And everybody is a karma yogi, whether we like it or not, or should be, because everybody's performing karma. And karma will give us restrictions. Karma will give us uh, will, will give us bondage. Action, all action is designed to bind us. Every action binds us. And our goal is freedom. And so therefore, when we convert karma action into karma yoga, the yoga of a detached action, not attached to any fruit, of our or result of our activities, then this then has the effect of calming the mind. What is the method? The method is calming the mind. The mind has an emotional aspect, calm the emotions. The mind has a willing aspect, calm the willing aspect. The mind has a thinking aspect, calm the thinking calm the over-intellectualization of things. And then everybody can meditate. These are the four yogas. The last meditation is common to all of them. The mind has the capacity to meditate. The mind has the capacity to 
move outward and react. The mind has a capacity to think. The mind has the capacity to feel. We can harness these various energies. We can think of them as energies and steer them in a non-troubling, non-disturbing way. So we get peace of mind. When we get peace of mind, we get revelation. Okay, so I think our time is almost gone. It looks like we have one minute to go. So it's because it's uh, eight o'clock. Oh, it's eight o'clock on the dot now. So uh, if there are no other questions, yeah, I will take my leave of you and you of me. Thank you. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you, Swami. 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 Merci beaucoup, Swami. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Swami Ji. Obrigado, Swami Ji. Obrigado. Swami. Yes. Oh.